Good morning, I'm Marlene. I'm Aileen. And today we'll be presenting our MIPS Pipeline Construction Processing Enhancement. Uh, our presentation today is going to cover the overview, a brief overview of hardware. We'll talk about the hardware changes required for pipelining. Uh, we transition from multi-cycle into pipelining. We'll be talking about our performance, uh, comparing both multi-cycle and pipeline, and future enhancements we'd like to add to our architecture. Uh, this is a top-level uh, overview of our processor. We have the three major blocks we've been working on this semester. We have our CPU, our data memory, and our I.O. unit. Inside our CPU, our pipeline data path is set up with new hardware. Uh, this hardware is here to uh, ensure that all the instructions are correctly and efficiently handled and executed. Uh, the, new, uh, the new additions we have are ha hazard unit, exception unit, uh, the branching unit, and forwarding unit, and the control unit. Well, we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, all these new additions in the next couple slides. Uh, this is a brief overview of the five-stage pipeline. Our stages are separated by pipeline registers. The first stage uh, is instruction fetch. It fetches, an ex uh, it fetches the instructions and it increments our program counter. Next, we have our instruction decode that translates the instructions into our control signals reads the register file, and for our pipeline, it also executes our jumps and branches. Next, we have our execute stage that performs all the ALU operations. Uh, next, we have the memory access. It accesses memory if we need it. And lastly, we have our write-back stage that will uh, update the register file. Inside our decode stage, we have our control unit. Our control unit uh, translates instructions into control signals. These control signals are cascaded uh, throughout the other pipeline registers. We have our exit control staging, our memory access control staging, our write back control staging. Uh, the control signals define what needs to be done in each stage. This differs from our multi-cycle because our multi-cycle used a finite state machine. Ours just uses combo logic and staging registers. Uh, next is our branching unit. Our branching unit calculates the target address for all jumps and branches. It also calculates the pass-fail conditions for branches. Um, if, a branch, if and after a branch passes, our instruction fetch before must be flushed because our pipeline assumes that the branch will not pass. Uh, the branching unit is placed in our decode stage. This minimizes the number of stalls required in our pipeline. Uh, for ours, we want to require one stall because we only need to flush the information out in our instruction fetch. Uh, we, we are able to do this so early in our pipeline because the branching unit only requires a couple gates to evaluate the branches. Um, it only requires a couple gates, not a full LEU to evaluate it. And we'll be looking a little bit closer into that in the next slides. This is our, hard, this is our Verilog implementation of our branching unit. Uh, the first block of code sets the value of S&T. Uh, as you can see, we have MUXs. These are controlled by the forwarding unit, which are going to be covered in the next slide. But it's just to ensure that the correct data is being compared. Next is our, it evaluates the branch uh, pass-fail. Uh, as I said earlier, we could just do that with a couple of gates to ensure, uh, to check if the branch will pass. We have a branch of equal, branch not equal, a branch of less than or equal to zero, and a branch if greater than zero. Lastly, we have our branch destination. This is what gets loaded into our program counter. Uh, this calculates a target address for all branch jumps and interrupts. Next, we have our forwarding unit. It's a solution to data hazards, which was one of the problems we encountered with pipelining. Uh, data hazard occurs when you attempt to use the result of an instruction before it has been written back to the register file. Uh, we have two types of forwardings. We have a branch forwarding, which forwards from the branch unit into the decode stage. And we have the ALU forwarding, which forwards from the ALU into the execution stage. And we'll be looking into that a little closer as well. Uh, this is an example where forwarding unit is necessary. We're subtracting uh, register 1 and 3 and placing the result in register 2. But as you can see in the next instruction, we require register 2, the results of register 2. So our forwarding unit is going to forward the data from our execute mem stage into the ALU. The next instruction also requires register 2, so our forwarding unit is going to forward the data from the write-back memory stage into our ALU. Uh, lastly, the 
The last instruction also requires register two, but the boarding unit is not necessary here because at the clock, because at that clock, our register, the data is already in the register. This is the hardware implement uh, the Verilog implementation of our forwarding unit. Our forwarding unit compares the source register of the two current instructions to the destination register of the two previous instructions. Um, as you can see for our LU forwarding, we're comparing the registers at RS to the register to the register address of either the memory stage or the write back stage. And if the memory write is enabled, it'll forward the data there. And for a branching unit as well, it'll also check if the in the decode stage, the address here and the address in the memory and write back stage. And if it needs to forward the data, it will forward the data through these MUXs. Inside our branching unit, we have kind of the same setup inside that have the MUXs just in case the forward data needs to get forwarded. And now I'll hand it off to Aiden. Thank you, Arlene. All right, so now we're going to talk about the hazard unit. So in cases where forwarding is not able to resolve data hazards, uh, we have the hazard unit It will stall the pipeline. So to stall the pipeline, we have three signals. We have a stall F, which stalls the fetch state stage, the stall D, which stalls the decode stage, and a flush E, which flushes the execute stage. So stall F will prevent the program counter from incrementing. Stall D will prevent the instruction register from being loaded with the next instruction. And flush E will set all control signals in the execute stage to zero, which effectively turns the execute stage into a no-op. Along with the first two stall signals, that will ensure that the same instruction is then executed on the following clock cycle, which accomplishes the stall. So there are three cases we need to watch for in our hazard unit. The first case is the load use hazard. That's where an instruction is dependent on the result of an immediately preceding load word. We have the write branch hazard, which is where a branch comparison is dependent on the result of an immediately preceding instruction. And a load branch hazard, which is a mixture of the first two, that's where a branch comparison is dependent on the result of a preceding load word. Also, our hazard unit will solve the pipeline while the CPU is servicing an interrupt request. And I will talk about that in the later slide. So a load use hazard, again, that's when an instruction is dependent on a load word immediately preceding the current instruction. Down below you can see we have an example. A load word stores its result in register 2, and the following instruction uses register 2 in, as one of its source registers. Now this AND instruction requires register 2 to be ready on clock 1, 2, 3, 4. So it needs it in clock four, but the load word is not ready until clock five. Therefore, the hazard unit will detect this. It will insert a stall into the pipeline, execute the AND on the following clock cycle, and the forwarding unit is able to forward the data correctly. Up top, we can see we have the Verilog implementation. It will check if the previous instruction is reading from memory, either data memory or I.O. memory. And it will compare the source registers against the destination register of that previous instruction. If all the conditions are met, it will solve the pipeline as shown below. Next we have the write branch hazard. Again, that's when a branch comparison is dependent on the result of an immediately preceding instruction. And here we can see an example of that. We have an AND instruction with the result stored in register 4. After that, we have a branch that uses register 4 as one of its source registers. We can see that the branch needs register 4 in clock 3. However, the result of the AND is not ready until clock 4. Therefore, the hazard unit will insert a stall into the pipeline so that the forwarding unit can correctly forward the data to the branch on the next clock. Again, we have our Verilog implementation up top. It will check if the current instruction is a branch, if the previous instruction wrote to a register, and if so, if that destination matches our source register addresses. If so, it will insert the stall as shown here. Lastly, we have a load branch hazard. That's when a branch comparison is dependent on the result of a preceding load word. We have a load word here. The result is going into register 2. And we have a branch following that where it uses register 2 as one of its source registers. 
Now this, you can see the branch requires register to on clock three again, but load word is not ready until clock five. This, we need to insert one stall. This is detected by a by the right branch hazard detection. So not this guy, but the guy in the previous slide. He will insert a stall here, but that is still not enough as this, this branch needs the register two on clock four, but it is still not ready until clock five. That's where the load branch hazard is detected. It will insert a second stall into the pipeline, which then allows the forwarding unit to correctly forward the data. So the exception unit, it will service interrupt requests. Upon receiving an interrupt request, it'll start a counter from one, two, three, and that counter is fed into the control unit, and each value of that counter corresponds to an instruction in a set of operations that will service the interrupt request. In addition, it will also generate the interrupt acknowledge after servicing the interrupt. So following is how we implement interrupts in module 13. These are the set of operations that the control unit executes. So the first step is to read data memory location 3FC. And that 3FC is gotten from the ALU via the SP init function. The second step is to save register to save PC plus 4 into register 31. In addition, we also save the flags register into a special register that is not accessible to the user, but is merely only there to save the flags in the event of an interrupt. The third and last step is to jump to the location that we read in the first step. And the end result is that the PC gets the address of the interrupt service routine and that the old PC and flags register have been saved. In module 14, the same number of steps are required, however they are slightly different. The first step is the same, you read data memory location 3FC, however this time the 3FC is not gotten via the SPNIT function, it is the contents of the stack pointer register. The second step is to decrement the stack pointer as well as store the program counter in that location. 3FC minus 4 is 3F8 and that's where the PC goes. The third step is to jump to the location that we read in the first step again and then also decrement the stack pointer again and save the flex to that location in memory. 3F8 minus 4 is 3F4. So returning from an interrupt in module 14, there's a similar process to servicing the interrupt. You need a specialized set of instructions to return from an interrupt. The first step again is very similar. We have we read data memory location 3F4, which is where we left this stack pointer when we jump to the ISR. The next step is we load the flags register with that location that we just read from. We increment the stack pointer and then read that location as well. The third step is to increment the stack pointer once again and then jump to the location that we read in step two data memory location 3F8. The end result is that the PC will get the pre-interrupt value that it once had. The stack pointer will be reset to 3FC. And the flags register will also be loaded back to their pre-interrupt values. So next we're talking about our performance. Here we have modules 1 through 13. We can see the runtimes for the multi-cycle architecture and the pipeline architecture. You can see next to that is the speed increase relative for each module. For modules 8, 10, and 13, the pipeline architecture was over three times faster, and in the case of module 10, it was 3.22 times faster. Wow. <laughs> Future enhancements we'd like to make for our processor. So the first one almost made it, didn't quite make the cut, ran out a little bit of time. Uh, it was branch prediction, one bit branch prediction. Uh, so the basic idea behind branch prediction is that on a branch pass, you store the program counter, the value, the, the, the PC value for that instruction, that branch instruction, in a branch history table. While you're fetching, if the program counter is in that table, you preemptively jump to the target address. So that means that you had previously, when you previously executed that branch, you jumped, and so you're predicting again that you'll jump again. So if the prediction is correct, 
you do not require a stall. If it is incorrect, one stall is required to correct the PC and erase that entry from the history table so that you do not jump again. You do not predict a jump if you do not pass. So the performance boost that this brings is apparent in module two. There's a loop that executes 16 branch instructions in a row. Uh, in our current implementation, uh, with 15 branch passes, we have 15 branch stalls. With a one bit branch prediction, we can take that down to two branch stalls. It will only mispredict the first and the last iteration of that loop. This cuts down on 13 stalls, <laughs> leading, leading to an 11% overall speed increase for that module. Lastly, we'd also like to add a superscalar architecture of the first degree, that is where you fetch a block of instructions simultaneously, you analyze that block of instructions for any dependencies, and a second execution unit will execute any instructions that are independent of each other in parallel. So the theoretical speed boost you can get from that will take our one CPI from pipelining to a potential two instructions per clock, potential double in speed. Thank you for your time. If there are any questions, we'll be able to answer them. What's a two-bit branch prediction? Did you guys look into that? What's the difference between a one-bit and a two-bit? So a two-bit branch prediction, that will that is a state machine, and it will ensure that the first time that you jump, that you your your branch passes, it will in the future predict that branch pass again. However, if it fails and then passes again, if it fails the first time, it will still predict it will branch the next time. Mm. It takes two fails to predict ah, a fail in the future. Still uses a history table? Does it still use? Yeah. It's interesting. Well, thank you. That was excellent. Appreciate it.